Um, and a lot of times, the people who live in those neighborhoods uh, feel as though the police are picking on them and harassing them uh, because um, they're they're in their area and there's so many lower level petty crimes that they see a lot of police. And it's not that the police are necessarily harassing the people. It's that if you take a look at for every hundred citizens in that broken windows community, there are, you know, eight crimes compared to every hundred citizens four blocks away. There are only two crimes. Well, you need to have four times the number of officers following up on what happened in the broken windows community. So it's not that the police are harassing them, it's that the police have a legal obligation to follow up on all these cases that are coming out of that community. Uh, so that's this is where sometimes there's some difficulty between the local population and the police. And the local population thinks they're being harassed when they're not. It's that the police have a legal requirement to follow up on all the cases that these people are creating. Uh, we hope that people get a, a quick response by the police. That's not always the case. Yeah, you have some neighborhoods that no police want to go into because every time they go in there, uh, somebody's shooting at them or, or something, and it's just a dangerous place to go. You know, I can remember when a partner of mine and I were uh, working with a gang task force, and we asked one police department where we went, you know, where do you guys not want to go? And they told us where it was, so we went there because we figured we could get some good gang intelligence by going in there. And we had kids that couldn't have been out of middle school, I don't think, uh, who were walking around showing us their guns, you know. And it's like, you know, dang. I mean, I had I had my, my auto loader and my partner had his shotgun, but uh, there's no way that we could have – we would have been like General Custer's last stand, you know. They would have just circled our little state van and, uh, and just mowed us down, and nobody would have known what happened. So we really have to reach out to these communities and get these people to understand that we're not there to harass them. We're not there to make their lives miserable. I would, I would love to go through a day uh, without having to put anybody in handcuffs or, or take any adverse action against anybody. Uh, but some people bring this on themselves, and some people are just in a terrible situation where they can't get out of the area where this crime follows them all the time. They're just stuck there, and uh, they don't have the means to get out, and that's the saddest part of it. We have a lot of really solidly good individuals, nice people, who are stuck in bad areas where they're surrounded by criminals and crime, and they end up being victimized over and over again, and it costs them so much being victimized that they can't get out of being in a, a crime-infested area. So this is where the investigation stuff comes in. Criminal investigators, unlike your patrol officers, Criminal investigators typically have about three years of service or so. They're experienced by that time. They're trained in investigatory techniques. They've gone to some additional training. They understand a little bit more about evidence and procedure and what's going to work in the courts in that area because they've had three years of testifying in those courts. So they know what the district attorney is looking for. They know what the solicitor general is looking for. And this is what helps to make them better investigators. So... When we were talking about time and rank, it's not that the police department is picking on, on officers. I and mean, Maybe you could go in there and be a, a great detective in six or nine months. The problem is, is that you just haven't been around there long enough to understand the minutia of, of the details that will be able to make you a real winning investigator. Uh, but after you've had three years of service, what they have found is that typically then you've had enough court appearances and enough time working with folks to where you can do a real good job with it. Some jurisdictions uh, maintain vice squads, and this is where they bring their new officers in. I know one, one very large department, uh, you go to work for them if you're a female, uh, almost instantly you go and you work uh, vice, you work prostitution rings. If you're a male, you almost always work, go to narcotics. And, uh, and that's just what they do with their new folks. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's the way that they're organized and set up, and that's how they um, decide to give people experience. So how do detectives detect? What, they, what is it that they do? Uh, they investigate, obviously, the causes of crime. They try to figure out who it was that did it, and they rely on field interviews, office interviews, and forensic evidence and put all this stuff together in a three-pronged approach to try to figure out who, who did what. Um, 
There's a specific focus where they interview witnesses, gather their evidence, record everything, and collect facts. You've seen lots of that on television before. There's general coverage where they canvass the neighborhood, conduct a lot of interviews. Maybe they go to employers or coworkers for additional information. Maybe they go to the victims or past victims, trying to establish timelines, trying to figure out some things that uh, different victims have in common. And then there's a lot of ways that detectives use modern technology today to be able to look in records and databases and things like that to be able to get more information together. Uh, then we talk about sting and undercover operations. Uh, detectives uh, work in sting operations to deceive criminals so that the criminals will openly commit illegal acts. A lot of people say these sting operations are, are basically entrapment. Uh, look at your um, prostitution catches, you know, where they have some... Uh, some policewoman who's acting as a hooker out on the street corner someplace, and they bust one John after another, after another, after another. Well, entrapment, the, the pseudo-legal definition of entrapment is when you get someone to do something that they would not normally do. Okay? You convince them to do something that is completely out of character with them. So say you set up a sting operation with, with a female officer working a corner someplace, and I drove up there and... Um, and I propositioned her to go to her room and, and to have some kind of a sexual encounter for the exchange of money or something of value. Um, it, depending on how I go about doing it, it's pretty easy to tell whether or not that's the first time I've ever done that act or not. Um, and so you'll have some people who'll be able to win in the entrapment defense and some who won't. Typically they won't because anybody uh, who is, uh, has any social maturity at all would understand what was taking place. Undercover work, very dangerous work. Uh, and one of the things that's dangerous about undercover work is the traumatization of the officers who are involved in it. Uh, you, may, you, you will probably see people being hurt. You will probably, be, uh, probably see people uh, who uh, have some criminal acts that are involved in drugs and uh, you know, often involve children being in the residence or um, other people who, you know, are challenged in some way who end up being hurt. You'll see a lot of what's called vicarious traumatization, and, and this wears on you after a while. And if you, if you work undercover in, in a true sense, deep undercover, where your identity is changed and all the rest of these things, you always face the potential danger that, um, that somebody else is going to get involved in um, – uh, making it pretty obvious who you are, and that, you know, obviously that would be dangerous as well. So when you lay down with dogs, you're bound to catch fleas. That's an old saying um, that you need to keep in mind because that's what happens a lot of times when you get involved in undercover work. Now, is undercover work a magic bullet to a promotion or whatever? Not necessarily. Professor. Sir. Uh, I have a question. Um, when you're undercover, do you ever think it's um, necessary to blow your cover to actually save countless uh, numbers of lives? Um, I don't know because I was never in that situation. Oh, okay. I was in a situation one time. Um, this is kind of an embarrassing story. I was in a situation one time where um, I was at a residence. There was a waiter who had a silver platter, and on top of that silver platter were substances that appeared to be illegal in nature, uh, some of them white powdery substances in lines, some of them in rolled what appeared to be marijuana cigarettes and other things, and uh, everybody was uh, ingesting those, and I didn't want to. So um, the host of the party uh, lined up some drinks on this table in the living room, and... Um, uh, asked, asked me to participate, and I had to kind of make a choice. You know, how am I going to do this? I don't want to get involved in any of the, these things, these illegals. I can get involved in this if I have to. At least that way I'm not going to stick out like a sore thumb. So I said, okay, fine, sure. So then he lit the darn thing up. There were flaming rums. I'd never had one of those suckers before, uh, and I didn't really know what to do. And then there was this girl who was really off her rocker, and she grabbed one, and she just downed it, and that kind of gave me the clue what I needed to do with it. So I did that, but when I touched the the uh, shot glass to my uh, lip, it burned my lip because it had already been sitting there for a minute, and so I splashed it all over my face, and my whole face went up in flames. 
And so I'm I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, this isn't cool. My I can I can smell my hair burning. My ears are really really hot, and my face is on fire. I need to put out my face. But I had a but I had contact lenses in, and I was like, okay. But if I open my eyes to find something to put my face out on, I'll probably burn my contact lenses to my eyes, and I'll that that's not cool. So this was back in the day when contact lenses were just were just coming out. So uh, so I looked, I, I blinked. I knew my left eye was my worst eye. So I blinked my left eye really fast, and I saw something white. And so I dove for what that was. Uh, and I patted my face out in that. And um, and then it was really nice because everybody was real nice to me, you know. And they were like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened to you. But, yeah, I lost, my, I lost all my eyebrows, uh, my eyelashes, the hair in the front of my uh, my head. Uh, it was it was a pretty uh, it was pretty uh, it was a pretty interesting experience, but that's but that's a, but I've I've never been in a situation where I had to um, quote unquote break the law or something in order to be able to do that. Now there are very heroic, wonderful individuals who have joined you know like one percenter motorcycle gangs and these kinds of things, and those guys have gotten down into the severe depths of depravity with these guys in order to be able to crack those those groups. I have all the respect and appreciation in the world for those guys. I would never put myself in the same league as them. Um, so that that experience, I, I I've got I've got some war stories that I typically don't don't really communicate. But um, uh, but uh, but there are some men and women out there who are doing very heroic things that no one will ever know about. Well, in your in your professional opinion, would you actually, if you we're in the situation where you had to blow your cover in order to save lots of lives, but you're dealing with an undercover case that's actually uh, tremendously serious to where um, the guy might be a major drug lord and, you know, I mean, spreading just, I mean, millions of dollars of drugs just everywhere. Would you, would you rather go after him or save? Uh, save Man, I don't, you know, that's a tough question life. because... Are those lives I'm saving, you know, quintuplets? You know, I mean, I mean you know what I'm saying? I, you know, it, but I mean, that yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, back in the day when I was involved in those kinds of activities, I was very young, uh, very arrogant about my abilities, and I healed very quickly. So um, um, I would I would probably, in all honesty, I would, I would probably have wanted to not have to have worried about those people who needed to have been saved in the process. But I legitimately would probably tell you now that, yeah, I would have blown it in order for those other people if they wouldn't have been killed. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, because at the same time, too, with, with him, you know, uh, spreading out millions of dollars of drugs, he's still killing people in some ways. Yeah, yeah. but the thing is, is you, you live to fight another day. True. You know, let somebody else pick up the ball and run with it. I mean, in the end run, these guys these, these guys self-destruct after a while. I mean, you, you, you have you have some huge international players who are so insulated from even their own governments that they're going to continue to do materially well anyway. I hope that there is such a thing as a heaven and a hell, and I hope that those guys go where they need to go when it's their turn to go. Um, but on this planet, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people who get involved in these kinds of activities are not of that magnitude, and they eventually get caught. It's just a matter of time. Uh, but good question, though. So police agencies, you know, we talked about how there's different levels of force. They've been trying to gain the respect of the communities that they, research, that they serve, and that's where community policing comes in. Community policing is all about getting back to the good old days where the officers walked down the sidewalk and where they knew that at 353 Elm Street that there was supposed to be uh, a, an elder senior citizen male and a senior citizen wife. And if they went to 353 Elm Street and they saw half a dozen teenagers, you know, having a bunch of crazy music and booze and smoke and dope and everything else, probably something bad happened to those two elderly people. Or, you know, they sold a the house and some lousy neighbors moved in. But whatever the deal, the officers would know what was going on in that area. And that helps to promote a cooperative working environment with the citizens. It helps to reduce the level of fear. It should reduce the level of crime in the area and, and improve the standard of living for everybody concerned. 
So what about categories? You know, foot patrols first were the first community policing initiatives. You know, that's when we first formed police departments. We didn't have cars. We didn't have bicycles. Uh, they walked every place they went. So the first foot patrol experiments were conducted in your Michigan and your New Jersey and your other northern to northeastern states because that's where the United States gradually developed from. Uh, evaluations of those foot patrol programs indicated it really didn't reduce the crime rate very much, but it did increase feelings of citizen safety because they, they could reach out to Jessica or Lamont or whoever that police officer was. They knew them. And and by knowing them and knowing something about their habits, uh, they they didn't feel alienated. You know, Jessica didn't intimidate uh, the young lady that lived at 353 Elm Street anymore. Um, so there's been a real huge increase over the years in community policing activities and returning back to those foot patrols that, you know, gave us what we had appreciated so much at the beginning of policing insofar as, as community safety is concerned. So what are some of the challenges of community policing? Well, we have to define what the community is. We have to define what the roles are of the officers within that community. For example, one of the biggest issues uh, we have confronting us in community policing is racial stuff. You know, if you have an all-white community, uh, but you put all non-white uh, police officers in that all-white community, is that going to work? Or if you have an all-black community and you put all all-white officers or all all Latino officers or all all Asian, you know, and obviously we don't ever put just one racial contingent of officers in any one community, but a lot of times departments don't have that much of a choice. A lot of times officers just don't have that much cultural diversity within their human resources. And so the community believes, the community is sensitized to whatever their values are, and the community perceives the officers coming in in some racial term. And as a result of that, then you have problems with that community. So you have to understand the community, and you have to understand what role you're going to be playing. And the, the supervisor that is in charge of the community policing for that needs to be actively engaged with the people who live there and needs to reorient the values of the officers who are responsible for that area to doing what it is that they're supposed to do and, bring, and recruit officers themselves who would be good for that area. Um, reach out to the people who live in that area and make sure that they're all a part of what's happening. Um, problem-oriented policing is a little bit different angle. Problem-oriented policing stresses a proactive problem solving instead of reactive crime fighting. So problem-oriented policing goes in in advance. It's kind of like uh, kind of like that movie Minority Report where they where they could project crime in advance. They could actually. They knew in advance that a crime was going to happen, so they could preposition assets and prevent it kind of thing. That's what problem-oriented policing is kind of like. Uh, it, it, if you're going to do problem-oriented policing, it requires that the police identify long-term problems and then develop strategies to eliminate those problems. And that's where you use some complicated computer programs like CompStat uh, and other programs to develop GIS systems, what are called GIS systems. Um, to develop hotspots and then be able to do an analysis of those hotspots to determine in advance. Well, look, for the last three years, this is what we've had happening in this area. And consistently, uh, at this in this neighborhood, we have had 35 of this type of crime happen these first two weeks of the month for three years. So what's going to happen in year four? We're going to have 35 of those same crimes, give or take, you know, happen there again because it's a consistent problem. So then what we do is we pre-position assets to try to deter those 35 uh, uh, acts from actually happening. And then since 911, we came up with this intelligence-led policing um, where we kind of incorporated some homeland security, uh, community-oriented poli uh, policing, problem-oriented and we kind of started wrapping it around into an intelligence program uh, using computers and using better collaboration between different levels of agencies. So now we've kind of got a situation where your local police department, instead of being real selfish with everything that it knows and keeping it only to itself, where we're starting to see those doors open up and people are starting to share information. And the local department will share with the county, and the county will share with the state. And this, this whole kind of process of uh, developing what are now called fusion centers, where we share information so that we can be more effective, is a much smarter way of doing law enforcement. In the old days, only 10 years ago, let's say, 
uh, well, 15 years ago, if you were a police chief of a small town, you would selfishly guard your information because that was something that gave you power. It gave you the ability to keep your job because it made you special. You had knowledge other people didn't have. Uh, nowadays, that's that's not the way the system works. Nowadays, your kudos come from you being a part of an integrated network where you're respected and admired for the information that you bring into the fold and for the help that you give other departments in solving their cases just as much as you. So you use confidential informants and interviews, you use crime reports and surveillance, you use different community sources of information, and you wrap all of this together in an intelligence gathering process that makes good sense for your local community. These fusion centers that I talked about are part of what's called the National Criminal Intelligence Sharing Plan. And the NCISP has developed regional fusion centers around the country as effective and efficient mechanisms to share information, maximize resources, streamline operations, and improve our ability to fight crime and terrorism. And that's the other part of it is that terrorists can exist where terrorists can't be seen. And so by sharing information and by determining patterns and by identifying actors and agents, uh, we can do a better job of trying to keep our, our country safe here at home. Uh, so we protect our homeland, we preserve public safety, and we collaborate with each other to get things done. And that's, that's, the, that's the overview of, of criminal justice agencies with a, with a main focus being there on that police department. So what have we talked about? We talked about getting on board with the police department. We talked about the hiring process, organizational charts, promotional structures, how those typically work the advantages of large organizations versus small ones, and then taking a look at the different policing types between the different agencies and how they all work. And I hope that this, this gave you some kind of insight, this gave you some kind of a, a general uh, introduction to uh, police agencies and the different ways that they're organized and why some have advantages or benefits over others. And, uh, and again, this is all going to be being wrapped up and will be uh, probably split into two different segments and put on YouTube so that you can go ahead and um, review these uh, whenever it is that, that you want to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording of the webinar now, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and open up the mics for a question and answer period, and, uh, and then we'll go ahead and call it a night. This is the end of part two. Hello, and welcome to the American Public Safety Training Institute, America's best source for online public safety training. We hope you enjoyed today's training presentation with your host, Mike Pozesny.